For today's um, lecture in the course that I'm teaching at uh, Glucksman Island House, New York University, I'm looking at um, the um, W.B. Yeats's Easter 1916, and in more general terms, at the uh, Yeats's perception and treatment of the Easter Rising in his poetry, and indeed in his uh, personal opinions that he expressed through uh, his letters and uh, in other ways. Um, when I last uh, talked about um, W.B. Yeats some weeks ago, I analyzed his uh, ideas about the creation of a national literature for Ireland in English language. And I would say that throughout the 1890s and the late 1880s, Yeats was a genuinely fervent uh, Irish nationalist trying to uh, generate a, uh, a view of Irish nationalism that would have uh, a high quality literature at its heart. And he had many of the attitudes that um, were expressed by, um, by uh, Douglas Hyde in the uh, great speech he gave, which led to the founding of the Gaelic League, the necessity for de-anglicizing Ireland. Um, so Yeats was, was, was fervent about the idea of building up uh, a national literary tradition for Ireland. And then in the, the first decade of the uh, 20th century, after he had uh, been involved in uh, writing his most, most nationalistic work, uh, Kathleen Houlihan, and then founding the Abbey Theatre in 1904, he started to sour about Ireland. He started to, to have doubts about uh, Ireland's uh, future direction. And in particular, um, he was um, frustrated and uh, disappointed by the uh, hostile reaction that occurred when um, Singh's Playboy of the Western World was first performed at the Abbey Theatre in 1907. Uh, there were demonstrations against the play. The play was condemned for, be, for giving a, uh, an unfair and a negative portrayal of uh, rural Ireland that, of course, was idealised by many in the nationalist tradition. Um, and then uh, he was also um, uh, upset and disenchanted by the response in Dublin to the uh, effort to, that he supported strongly to create a new municipal gallery to house the paintings that had been donated to Ireland by Lady Gregory's nephew, uh, Hugh Lane, who ultimately died on the Lusitania in 1915 when that uh, vessel was sunk off the uh, coast of Cork, off the old head of Kinsale. And indeed, the dispute about the ownership of those paintings has raged between uh, London and Dublin, Britain and Ireland for uh, the last century. Um, so by the time, say, the second decade of the 20th century came around, it was thoroughly disappointed, disenchanted, disaffected with Ireland. And that, I suppose, comes out most clearly in the poem he wrote uh, in 1913 at the time of the Dublin lockout. It yes, didn't necessarily sympathise with the, the workers uh, who were locked out in that great labour dispute, but he, he was hostile to, the, uh, to those in Dublin who, were, who, were, who lined up against uh, the workers. So he wrote this um, poem called September 1913. This is just the first verse, just to give you an illustration of the, the level of Yeats's disenchantment. What need you, being come to sense, but fumble in a greasy till and add the half pence to the pence and prayer to shivering prayer until you have dried the marrow from the bone? For men were born to pray and save romantic Ireland's dead and gone, it's with O'Leary in the grave. In this poem, he goes on to, to refer to Lord Edward Fitzgerald, to Robert Emmett, to Wolf Tone, and all that delirium of the brave. And then he, he basically argues that the great tradition, the great romantic Irish nationalist tradition of Tone, Emmett, Lord Edward Fitzgerald, and others, that's all gone. It's all dead and gone, along with John O'Leary, who had died in uh, 1907. Uh, and, of course, O'Leary was, was Yeats' epitome of the kind of nationalist that he admired, who actually encouraged him to take an interest in being an Irish writer and to, to read and to, to study uh, the history and, and the literature of Ireland, which, of course, Yeats made his, yeah, his, his life's passion. And, indeed, even in his, his last poem, you have um, uh, his statement, Ancient Ireland knew it all, and then 
uh, urging people to, to never depart from what he called the indomitable Irishry. And of course, uh, Yeats also at this time, I think, wrote some very unsavoury poems, you could even say uh, nasty uh, pieces of poetry. For example, he attacked, you know, Biddy and Pauline. This is a kind of a, almost like a, a slur against uh, the sort of ordinary uh, people of uh, Dublin and the sort of Catholic Irish that Yeats was sort of looking down on, in a, if you like, from a pedestal. And was in danger, I think, of becoming a rather bitter and an arrogant uh, poet. And uh, for example, there's a, a poem called Pauline, which I think borders on being a kind of a sectarian rant. Uh, indignant at the fumbling wits, the obscure spite of old Pauline in his shop, I stumbled blind among the stones and thorn trees under morning light, until a curlew cried, and in the luminous wind the curlew answered, and suddenly thereupon I thought that on the lonely height where all are in God's eye, there cannot be confusion of our sound forgot, a single soul that lacks a sweet crystalline cry. So it's, it's sort of this very nasty, negative attitude towards Pauline at the, at the fumbling wits of and the obscure spite of, of our Pauline in his shop. So it's sort of a, a condemnation almost of the uh, you know the, the small shopkeeper who would have been you know, the epitome really in a way of the Dublin of that time in early twentieth century uh, Ireland. So if you like, it was was being turned off by what he saw as Ireland having taken a, a wrong road, a wrong route in its um, evolution, uh, in its nationalist, uh, the evolution of its nationalist tradition. And then along came uh, 1916. Now Yeats was uh, in, staying in, in rural England at the time when he heard about the rising in Dublin. And uh, he was shocked by it, like many, many people were, and no one really expected that this rising would take place. Uh, it, 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 it shocked everyone, uh, frankly. It was, it was, it was organised by a relatively small group uh, within the Irish Republican Brotherhood who gained control of the Irish Volunteers after the Volunteers split in 1914 when um, there was a division because of, uh, between those who supported the war effort led by John Redmond and those who refused to do that when they were being led by Owen McNeill and they were the ones who fought in 1916 alongside the Irish Citizen Army led by James Connolly. So it was a small group of people of maybe a thousand or so um, volunteers and um, Citizen Army people were out in 1916, um, and Yeats was was worried that uh, you know um, the, the coming of a, 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 a violent event like the Easter Rising would actually would actually have a, a negative effect on Ireland. He worried that that things would go uh, from bad to worse in Ireland, and that all that he had tried to do over the years to 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 bring people together would be uh, damaged by this um, sudden cataclysmic event. Uh, but when he when he when he sort of and of course, he, he also he knew a lot of the people who were involved in the Rising. He knew Patrick Pierce, uh, he knew McDonough, Thomas McDonough, uh, knew Constance Markovitz, obviously, uh, and uh, he, of course, knew Sean McBride, if, if not in a positive way, but knew, uh, knew him because he, he was the estranged husband of um, Yeats's love interest, uh, Maud Gone. So, so it was a kind of a, it, for a, for a poet, it was unusual that he should have had such an intimate connection with an event like the Easter Rising of 1916. But when he wrote this poem, and remember he wrote this poem only uh, a couple of months after the Rising, um, the uh, executions of the leaders took place in early May, and Yeats um, printed this poem and, and distributed it, uh, a small number of copies to his friends. They didn't put it into the public domain until much later on, but it was distributed and it did reflect his initial response to the Rising, which I think is, is probably one of the most impressive um, public poems in English of the 20th century and, and I would regard it as, as a seminal history poem as part of the Yeats uh, canon. It's, it's, a, it's a major poem reflecting on, a, on, a, on, a, on an event of significant historical significance, the Easter Rising of 1916. And he starts with a sort of a um, acknowledging that he didn't take these people seriously. I've come I've met them at close of day, coming with vivid faces from counter and desk among grey 18th century houses. So he didn't take these people very seriously. Uh, he thought that they, um, they, they were um, just playing the game of being revolutionary. He didn't expect them actually to do what they eventually did in 1916. Then he goes on to describe um, four of the uh, 
the participants in the Easter writing that he knew personally. Um, uh, you have um, a reference to Patrick Pierce. Uh, you have reference to Constance Markovich, that woman's days were spent in ignorant goodwill, her nights in argument until her voice grew shrill. What voice more sweet than hers when young and beautiful, she wrote to Harriers. So he's remembering um, Constance Markovich when she was Constance Gore Booth in Sligo, a member of the West of Ireland aristocratic family, the Gore Booths. Um, now she's a revolutionary um, and involved in this um, a, a great event in Dublin. Uh, then you had um, Patrick Pierce. This man had kept a school and rode our winged horse. Pierce was, of course, uh, a writer who had, had quite a su reasonably successful uh, poet in the English language uh, and indeed in Irish as well. So, so a writer who actually ran a school. So a schoolmaster, a headmaster of school, and a writer. Some the kind of person that Yeats could could you know could normally be familiar with because he was familiar with Dublin of that time because he was back and forth all the time, especially during the time when he was setting up and running the Abbey Theatre in Dublin. And then uh, Thomas MacDonagh, this other, his helper and friend, was coming into his force. He might have won fame in the end, so sensitive his nature seemed, so daring and sweet his thought. That's Thomas MacDonagh, who was really was developing as a writer and, and wrote some very good uh, pieces of literary criticism as well, which kind of supported Yeats's idea that you could have literature in English written in an Irish mode, but it could also be Irish despite being written in English. Uh, so so MacDonagh could have been, I think, a significant figure had he survived, uh, but it was, of course, one of the victims of the Easter Rising when he was executed in early May of, of 1916. And then um, a reference to um, Major John McBride um, uh, as um, a drunken, vainglorious lout. Uh, and, but then he said, but he too has resigned his part in the casual comedy. He too has been, has been changed in his turn, transformed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. So here you have this expression of ambivalence. It's, it's, a, it's a brilliant expression of Yeats's ambivalence. It wasn't a beautiful beauty, a wonderful beauty, or a terrible incident. It was a terrible beauty. So he recognised both the, the idealistic element in the rising, but also the fact that the rising was a destructive, a violent event that, had, that, that, that caused the loss of a significant number of lives in Dublin and the destruction of the centre of Dublin during those six days of fighting in the city. And then Yeats goes on to, uh, to meditate on the rising. And he, and, he, and he says that, heart with one purpose alone, through summer and winter seem enchanted to a stone to trouble the living stream. So there he's thinking about these people. They had, they were, they had hearts that had one purpose alone. And through summer and winter, they seem enchanted to a stone. They seem to be stony in their determination to achieve their political aims through this uh, insurrection they were planning in Dublin. And then in the, in the fourth verse, he goes on to continue this meditation. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart, or when may it suffice? So he's, he's, he's recognizing that, that sacrifice, the sacrifice these people had made, the leaders of the Easter Rising had made, could have both positive and negative implications because too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart. And for a poet like Yeats, ultimately with a romantic view of life, seeking meaning in the world around him through mysticism, through literature, through engagement in, in the public life of Ireland, this was something that was uh, worrying, concerning to him. And then he goes on uh, to ask a question that has resonated down the last 110 years since the Easter Rising, 106 years since the Rising. He wrote, he wrote, was it needless death after all, for England may keep faith for all that is done and said. So there you have Yeats, a couple of months after the Rising, asking the question, was it needless death? Did it have to happen? Did these people have to die in order to achieve freedom for Ireland? For England may keep faith. In other words, after the war ends, 
It ended finally in November 1918. Went on much longer than anyone expected, but it did finally end. But yes, was wondering, after the war ends, will England, in any case, give home rule to Ireland and therefore enable Ireland to have self-government and ultimately maybe a more advanced form of freedom? And that question has been asked repeatedly by historians for the last 100 plus years. Was the violence triggered by 1960 and continued into the War of Independence and the Civil War and then ultimately uh, in Northern Ireland in the, the 70s, 80s and early 90s until the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 which brought an end to the um, conflict in Northern Ireland. Was that violence necessary? Could, it, could, could those uh, gains have been achieved? So yet in a way, could they have been achieved without the resort to violence, without the recourse to violence? So Yeats is really, if you like, the first revisionist. And revisionist historians have been mulling over that issue for the last 100 years, especially for the last 50 years. So for me, at least, Yeats was very perceptive in his analysis of the Easter Rising. At that very early stage, he understood that all had changed, changed utterly. He said in one of his letters, I don't know what's going to happen but I know nothing will ever be the same again. So he understood the impact of the rising very early on. But a lot of people might have, might have thought that perhaps Irish people would go back to supporting the Irish party, the party of Parnell and now Redmond, who were on the verge of delivering home rule and hopefully would deliver home rule after the war came to an end. But Yeats understood instinctively that there had been a change. And that change, I think, excited Yeats. So here's the, the final few lines of this great poem. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? I write it out in a verse, Macdonough and Macbride and Connolly and Pierce, now and in time to be, wherever green is worn, are changed, changed utterly, a terrible beauty is born. Yeats didn't leave the Easter Rising aside at that stage. He wrote... Two more poems about the rising. One called 16 Dead Men, which focuses on the deaths of the leaders of the Easter Rising. The 15 were executed in Dublin, and then Roger Casement, who was executed later uh, in the year in London, having been tried there for treason and convicted. So here's how he finishes this poem, 16 Dead Men. Oh, here, here, sorry, here's the Here's the beginning of it. Oh, but we talked at large before the 16 men were shot. But who can talk of give and take, what should be and what not, while those dead men are loitering there to stir the boiling pot? So he's, he's acknowledging that the, the execution of the leaders of the Easter Rising had made a huge difference because how could we talk about give and take and, and compromise when those dead men are loitering there to stir the boiling pot. And he goes on, you say that we should still the land till Germany's overcome, but who is there to argue that now Pierce is deaf and dumb? And is there logic to outweigh Macdonough's bony thumb? And then finally, how could you dream they'd listen that have an ear alone for those new comrades they have found Lord Edward and Wolf Tone, or meddle with our give and take that converse bone to bone. So he is elevating the leaders of the Rising and putting them up there in that canon of Irish political martyrs with Lord Edward Fitzgerald and Wolf Tone. And he says, those who argue that we should quiet everything, we should go quiet in Ireland until the war ends. How are we going to make that argument when Pierce is now deaf and dumb and against Macdonough's bony thumb. And then in the third poem, The Rose Tree, he um, records an imaginary conversation between um, Connolly and Pierce about how to water the rose tree, the symbol of, of freedom. And ultimately, uh, the, he says, Connolly says to Pierce, we, we can water the rose tree with our own blood. So he is there 
acknowledging the, the principle of, of blood sacrifice. So Yeats was genuinely, I think, stirred by the Easter Rising. It gave him back an interest in Ireland, which lasted him for most of the rest of his life. Um, gone was the disenchantment. It came back again in the 1920s, by the way, but which we'll talk about in a later session. But gone for the time being, at least, was a disenchantment. And there was a renewed commitment to Ireland, a renewed interest in Ireland. And Yeats, indeed, went back to Ireland uh, and from 1917 onwards, lived most of his time in Ireland, lived in Dublin, and then uh, was spent the summers down in uh, Tour Valley Lee, which he bought in 1917, this um, Norman Tower, which he restored and became a kind of a symbolic um, uh, location for him in the west of Ireland, where he witnessed the War of Independence and indeed the Civil War. So Yeats's commitment to Ireland was renewed. So the man who had said Romantic Ireland's dead and gone is with O'Leary in the grave uh, in 1913, in less than three years, was energized, was was um, engaged again by the Ireland that had changed, changed utterly because of the Easter Rising of 1916. So thank you for um, listening to this um, summary, video summary of the latest uh, seminar in my um, Literature as History course that I'm teaching at Glutton Ireland House at, at New York University. I'll be back next week with a session um, devoted to the, the works of Sean O'Casey. Thank you.